Welcome back. Time for the lid. Our panel is back. George Will, Maureen Dowd, Andy Card, Karen Tumulty. Maureen, I wanted you here because I loved your piece about the uh, about you and this president and President 41. You were the chief White House correspondent, right? Uh, among them at the at the times at the at, at the at during that era. I was, were you not? Yes, I was one of them. Yes. Bob Woodward always says every president gets the psychoanalyst he deserves. And that was you? <laughs> I guess it was, yeah. What was interesting about your relationship with him is, is that it wasn't mean, was it? If he had a problem with you, he didn't get angry. Yeah, did it was like a, a sort of a 40s screwball comedy, uh, like I was the Gene Arthur working girl ethnic reporter and he was the Jimmy Stewart waspy rich guy, without the romance, of course. Um, but it was it was interesting because he was all noblesse oblige and I was all uh, class rage and it was right at the beginning of the time when the white male waspy patriarchy was breaking up and and he it, it took him a while to adjust to the idea that someone like me was going to be covering him. I think he thought he would have Horatio Hornblower the fourth, you know, drinking martinis <laughs> and talking about the North Atlantic Alliance. And he got me calling him goofy and, you know, complaining. My favorite story is that he had to, like, he had to hide from his son that he went and snuck and, and had coffee with you. Oh, uh, no, he wanted to have yeah. coffee with me in Kennebunkport, and he had Carl Rove call me to see if we could set it up. But he... It would have been like him and his Secret Service agents sneaking out to meet me at a coffee shop and avoiding W and his Secret Service agents. So it was very complicated. But I love this, you know, skull and bone skullduggery of it because he was the head of the CIA and he still had a few tricks up his sleeve. <laughs> uh, Karen, I, I, I am, as I said, I'm in the split screen world. I don't want to let this day go with Mueller and what we're learning today uh, on this front. What is your sense of the significance of where this is headed with Mueller? And, and especially when he puts in there, when you serve in office, you know, you got to be held to the highest standard, which, of course, feels more poignant today as we just said goodbye to one of America's probably most famous public servants. Well, the significant, I mean, don't forget, it's one of Trump's first acts as president was essentially to go to James Comey and tell him to just sort of let this case against Flynn slide. Now we have Mueller coming around full circle and saying, you know, keep him out of jail because he's cooperating. We're getting so much information out of him. And so, I mean, as everyone has said earlier, this, it's all in the redactions here, I guess, but it, it does seem like people who thought it was going to be over quickly, that it was essentially going to be something that Trump could get past, um, I think aren't thinking that today. And do you think it's possible that the, the, the lawmakers that attended today's ceremony listen to what everybody was saying today? You know, at the same time, they're watching what's happening in real time. They're seeing a, a man of Bob Mueller's pedigree uh, make this case that something is something's wrong here. Something smells, um, and we're putting we're saying goodbye to a man who made integrity sort of his lifelong mission. I actually think they were listening. I'm not sure that they found the courage to act. Uh, I I think they know what the noble thing to do is, and they're finding a way to do it. But they haven't found the courage to do that yet. And maybe he's introducing a little courage, too. But it's restraint and respect. And I'm not sure that they've quite got there on the restraint side. Mm -hmm. And I still think they're learning on the respect side. George, well, the story of an RNC chairman, George Bush, basically not def just being a knee-jerk defender of Nixon in that moment, that in itself today would be considered courageous. That's right, and it's worth remembering that Mueller is from Bush's world. Yes. St. <laughs> Paul's School Athlete of the Year, Princeton Marine Corps officer, University of Virginia Law School, the whole thing. And he, I, the biggest puzzle to me, and maybe someone here has intuitions about it, about the whole Mueller probe is this. He got, what, 16 hard-charging type A personalities to get off their fast tracks and their lucrative careers and come here. And he didn't say, come on down, we're going to indict someone called Papanopoulos. 
He told them there's something here. He must have enticed them with that. Second thing that puzzles me, and, and nothing that he's done so far, with all the redactions, clears this up. We know what the Russians wanted to do. They wanted to sow salt in our social wounds and make them worse. And they wanted Mr. Trump to get elected. But they did not need to collude with his campaign. They were much more professional about this than his campaign ever could have been. No, I, I, sense the, the, I think he's on to something else. And I, 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 more, I mean, it does seem as if, Maureen, when you look at what Michael Flynn was doing with the, gov the country of Turkey while also advising an incoming president of the United States, that to me is where this probe gets much more, I think, uh, troublesome for other people around this president. Yeah, uh, Mueller reminds me of the guy in the white hat hunting Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. He keeps coming and they keep turning around going, who is that guy, you know, and he just keeps coming. And uh, as Andy said, Bush Sr. loved and respected institutions and Trump doesn't. So when Trump was going to fire Comey, Bannon warned him and said, well, you can fire Comey, but the, the investigation goes on. And Trump didn't understand. He thought if you just fired one man, it would be over. He doesn't even fathom, I think, the trajectory of what's happening. I would argue, Karen, that that's actually been part of the problem, for instance, with this issue with China. He's, I had somebody say this. He thinks everything's a real estate, a, a, a two-bit real estate deal, and he's overmatched in everyone, and he's more overmatched than he f is fully appreciative of, whether it's Mueller or whether it's the Chinese. Well, in part because he's also, it's a real estate deal, and he also sees it as a branding exercise, that if, as long as he just keeps declaring there's a victory here, that people will believe it. Well, the fact is that the, you know, the economy, the world economy doesn't operate according to slogans, and nor do criminal investigations. Andy, I want to close with this final thought that I had that we were discussing today, and that was the fact that there's a lot of things that we're praising George H.W. Bush for, that in the t at that time was ordinary. Working across the aisle, that's ordinary. Signing bipartisan, that used to be the ordinary of this town. Does it say more about us or about him? I think it says more about the time. Uh, look, at the mob is much closer to the rule today because of the internet. That means many more decisions are made out of emotion rather than logic and judgment. And there's nothing we can do about it, but it used to be that if you were angry with a congressman, you sent them a letter and it took seven days to get there and would be in the staff and you'd get the answer and a, a thoughtful answer would go out. Today, you get a tweet and you're expected to respond to the emotion of the tweet with the same level of emotion. And you do. And then you get stuck on stupid and you can't change. Well, I think about what's happening to the French. There's this protest. It's succeeded. But they don't know who to negotiate with, George. It's literally, well, who's the leader of this movement? They don't know. And this is, actually goes to what you're saying. It's mob rule. Yeah. Find someone in a yellow vest in, <laughs> in France and try, and try and make that person a leader. It's very difficult. The only thing worse than a hydra-headed mob is a mob with no head whatever. <laughs> That's right. uh, thank you all uh, thank for you. spending time, uh, especially on this day, sharing your memories and thoughts. And I'll be right back. Hello, YouTubers. If you're watching this, it means you've checked out our channel, so thank you. Now do me a favor. Subscribe by clicking on that button down there. Click on any of the videos to watch the latest interviews and highlights from MTP Daily and MSNBC. You can get more Beat the Press content every morning in the First Read newsletter. If you're tired of content that you don't know anything about where it came from, you don't have to have that problem with us. NBC News, MSNBC, MTP, and the Meet the Press mindset right here for you on YouTube. Subscribe now.